Hi, my name's Nick Yuschak, and I'm the government CTO for AIM Photonics and am co-chairing the session. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Zhifang Liu uh, from Dartmouth College. His major uh, research field is in integrated photonics, particularly for low energy photonic data links and nanomaterials and nanostructures for solar uh, thermal and so solar voltaics. And he's gonna discuss some of his work here today. Thanks for the introduction and inviting me back here. So uh, I was asked to give a, a tutorial on waveguide coupled detectors, which is basically the work I have been working on uh, for many years, uh, especially back in MIT. Uh, but I decided to give it a little bit trick to uh, talk, talk about some functionality beyond the photo detectors. So you know that germanium is actually one of the oldest semiconductor material, and this is basically the first transistor people have ever made. And you can actually see why we draw the, uh, the diode like this in the circuit, because this is directly mimicking this. Uh, interesting thing is that this most important piece, which is single crystalline germanium, is only taking as a little dash here. And people were, were thinking that maybe this is the device, but actually it's this piece of material. This dash is really important for us. Uh, germanium has been forgotten as a uh, electronic material for many years because silicon took over. But starting from 20 years ago, uh, people rediscovered the nice optical properties of germanium. So that's why we were moving back to germanium photonic devices integrated on silicon. So in this talk, I'm going to start with the basics about germanium growth on silicon and band engineering. So basically why it's good for light absorption, photodetectors, and some other functionalities here. So we'll then show you basically that waveguide integration is not just a requirement for making an integrated photonic circuit, but also enhance the performance of detectors themselves. So you can get higher uh, bandwidth, higher efficiency, and lower dark current with waveguide integration. We'll then move on to talk about the different waveguide coupling schemes we use in, uh, in the photonic integration. And uh, lastly, we'll, get, we'll talk about the functional functionality of detectors beyond detectors. So here's the outline of the talk. So we'll start with the germane growth first. So uh, that's partially because I, I, I'm a uh, material science person. So it turns out it's a great challenge to, to grow germanium on, on silicon because there's a 4% lattice mismatch. Well, 4% doesn't sound large, but actually it's a big mismatch in terms of material as tax of growth. So if you directly deposit germanium on silicon due to this 4% lattice mismatch, you tend to get this kind of islands to release the strain. Uh, so in this case, you cannot really get a nice controlled planar uh, layer. Another challenge you get is that, is that basically you get a lot of dislocations, uh, again, due to this mismatch. So the way to get around that, first one is basically we can maintain this planar growth by using a low temperature germanium buffer layer at low temperatures. So basically uh, we grow at low temperature, the, uh, uh, the fusion of atoms is con uh, kinetically suppressed. So although there's a tendency to form the islands, basically the, uh, the kinetic, kinetic suppression uh, prevent that from do uh, from prevent that from happening. Uh, the other way to get around the dislocation is basically you can perform some um, uh, kneading at higher temperature. In this case, the diffusion, uh, the dislocations will move around, and those with opposite Burgers vectors will just cancel out of one another. So essentially, after kneading, you can get a pretty nice uh, piece of material with much less dislocation density. In the blanket film, you can get to the uh, density about one, uh, one time 10 to the seven per centimeter square. And if you do a selected growth in a small area, because the dislocations can apply to the edge of the, uh, the masses, basically you can further reduce that dislocation density by one more order of magnitude. So this is basically the most popular method we are using now to, to fabricate germain devices on silicon because it avoids using very thick buffer layers and is more compatible with CMOS processing. So in terms of the, uh, the processing integration, uh, in this case, Germanium aftaxis is typically uh, grown between the front end of line and back end of line processing. So basically before, uh, after you have the gate formation before the metallization. So in many cases we do this kind of selected growth. We are basically uh, de uh, deposit uh, a uh, germanium silicon piece in the trench and you have the CMOS transistors just sitting on the side. So this is the work we have done uh, with BAE systems before. And basically this is the selected growth and because you have single crystal material, you have this nice facet. That's basically the same thing as you see on a diamond. 
And this passage, of course, is not necessarily good for your uh, modeling of the uh, optical modes and design. So what you do, you can, uh, which, what, what you can do later is basically you follow something similar to the Damascene process. You can actually TMP this top off and basically get a nice uh, rectangular cross-section for the germane waveguide part as a photodetector. And in terms of band structure, if you look at germanium, well, the textbooks are always saying germanium is an indirect active semiconductor, meaning that if you want to uh, absorb a photon, it has to match the momentum on this L value in the 1, 1 direction. And 1, 1 is basically just the body diagonal of the cube lattice. Uh, and that usually very inefficient. But actually, if you look at the uh, direct transition here, germanium has a direct gap of about 0.8 electron volts. Uh, if you do, do some uh, quick calculation, you know that that corresponds to 1550 nanometer, which is basically the telecom uh, wavelength we are interested in. So uh, basically, utilize this direct gap transition, we can uh, greatly uh, benefit from the uh, absorption of germanium, uh, which is very efficient in this case. And if you want to uh, extend the absorption range, because sometimes you want to absorb light in longer wavelengths, for example, in an L-band, you can actually play some tricks here. For example, one of the tricks you can play is basically introduce uh, tensile strain to germanium. When you introduce tensile strain, uh, strictly speaking, your cubic lattice is becoming a tetragonal lattice. So that's why your uh, band structure is changed. And now your uh, direct gap is actually decreasing faster with the tensile strain than the indirect gap. Eventually, at some stage, this germanium material was transformed into a direct gap semiconductor. So uh, in terms of our applications at wavelengths near telecom, basically a small amount of tensile strain can al already help a lot to shift the band edge to 1650 nanometers or so. Uh, and if you want to move it further, we actually have uh, other methods. So this is basically talking about how do you introduce the tensile strain uh, into germanium. Actually, if you grow the aftertaxel germanium film on uh, silicon, naturally you get tensile strain from the thermal mismatch between germanium film and silicon substrate. And the reason is that basically germanium has a larger thermal expansion coefficient than silicon. When you grow the material at high temperature, basically the thin film is going to be relaxed, meaning there's no strain at the gross temperature. When you cool down to room temperature, basically because germanium has a larger uh, thermal expansion co coefficient, it tends to shrink more. But the substrate is not going to shrink that much. So basically it's holding it off. So that's why I accumulate this tensile strain into germanium. Just by this simple approach, you can get about 0.2 to 0.3% tensile strain into germanium and shift the band edge to around 16, 20 nanometer to cover the L band. And if you want even more strain, well, you can play, play around with stressors as you do with CMOS transistors. So nitride stressor is a very standard process in making strain transistors. Uh, so people have utilized similar structures, uh, in this case in silicon nitride, and they also do an undercut etching to suspend the uh, germanium part, uh, and they can actually get about 1.5% strain uh, in this case. So depending on the wavelengths you want to work with, you can actually engineer this tensile strain to your advantage. Uh, another development, development in recent years is that uh, if you want to shift the uh, interested wavelength range to mid-infrared regime for sensing applications, actually there's another uh, trick you can, you can play with, which is basically to incorporate tin into germanium. So uh, this chart basically shows you the uh, energy difference between the indirect and direct gap, as well as the direct gap uh, magnitude itself, versus bioxyl tensile strain and uh, the amount of tin you alloy into germanium. So you can see that uh, when you get about 10% tin, you already get the material into uh, direct gap semiconductor because indirect value, uh, ind indirect band gap is equal to the direct gap in this case. Uh, and if you introduce some tensile strain, this transition can happen ha at lower tin composition. Uh, and whatever way you use, basically you find when, when this material trans transforms into direct gap semiconductor, the band gap is about half electron volts. If you further increase that, basically you can well extend into the mid infrared regime. So the uh, waveguide integrated detectors based on germanium and germanium tin can not only work can not only work for telecom wavelengths but also the mid IR wavelengths for sensing applications. Okay, so let's come to the uh, topic of waveguide integration. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, basically this is not just for the completion of the photonic circuit but also for performance enhancement of the detector itself. So let's see uh, how does it compare to a free space detector. 
let's assume we have a simple free space detector like this. So you have a uh, photon coming in, you have a chunk of material with the thickness to interact with the photon. So you know there's a certain absorption coefficient from the material, which means that it absorbs a certain amount of time per unit depth of the material here. So if you want to, want to make this detector efficient, you tend to think, hey, okay, okay, you have to make it thick. So if you want to make it thick, the problem is that when you generate electron hole pairs or the carriers, they have to transit a longer, longer distance in this detector between the two electrodes on the top and bottom. So therefore, your bandwidth is going to be, li to be limited by the, uh, uh, by the uh, transit time of carrier. So basically, your bandwidth is going to, going to be traded off. While in other case, if you, if you make a thinner absorber, basically you can make the transit time higher, so your bandwidth goes up, but your efficiency goes down. So that's why the uh, free space detectors usually have this trade-off between bandwidth and efficiency. And if you look at the product, basically there's, a, uh, there's basically a, a saturation at some point. However, if you do the waveguide coupling, things are very different. Now, everything is a planar device, so you couple the light into the waveguide and then couple into the detector. Now, your detector can be as long as you need to absorb all the light, and you can put the electrodes on a direction that's perpendicular to the light propagation direction. So you collect the carriers in a very short distance, and you absorb the optical photons in a long optical path. So basically, you can achieve high uh, photocurrent or high responsivity and high bandwidth at the same time. What is more, because you can now afford to make very narrow, long strip of devices. The overall area can be much smaller than what you have in the uh, free space detectors. So in this case, your absolute duct current is also going to decrease because basically the, the, the duct current will scale with the device area. So essentially you're trying to, uh, equivalently you're trying to concentrate more photons into a small, smaller volume. And that's basically going to increase your signal to noise ratio. Uh, so before we go to the uh, analysis of bandwidth uh, efficiency, uh, just going to briefly talk about the uh, bandwidth of the detectors. So uh, basically, there are two limiting factors to the uh, 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 bandwidth of detectors. Let's assume a vertical PIN junction structure, which is, which is basically the most widely used in waveguide coupled detectors because of its easiness of fabrication and also relatively high electric field in this intrinsic region, high and uniform electric field. So we have a good electric field in the intrinsic region. Basically, your carriers are collected by drift, which is a fast process compared to uh, diffusion. So that makes make your device faster. So assuming this kind of structure, uh, we can actually calculate the RC-limited uh, bandwidth versus transit time-limited bandwidth. So RC is basically because you have a load resistance. Also, this PI induction is, is by itself a, a capacitor. So you calculate this kind of uh, uh, bandwidth, basically you'll find that if you have a, a thicker absorber here, thicker uh, uh, intrinsic layer here, uh, the uh, capacitance is going to decrease, so therefore your uh, RC limited bandwidth is going to increase. However, if you look at the uh, transit limited bandwidth, it's the opposite case, because the transit time is going to increase with the uh, thickness of this intrinsic layer, intrinsic abs absorber of germanium. So therefore, you know there has to be an optimal somewhere. So if you put this into the 3 bit dB bandwidth in, in relation to the transit time and RC limited bandwidth, you can f easily figure out your maximum uh, uh, 3 dB frequency for a given device area A. And you also figure out what's the uh, optimal thickness for that piece of detector. So that's being plotted in this figure on the right. So uh, not surprisingly, as you go uh, reduce the device area, you can get much higher uh, bandwidth, maximum bandwidth, and also you can allow a thinner uh, layer of uh, intrinsic germanium over here. So now the next slide, we're going to show you the uh, improvement in bandwidth efficiency plot products. So in this paper we published uh, with Jürgen and uh, Kim uh, a few years ago, uh, basically we did a, a calculation about uh, you know, how, how much you can improve this bandwidth efficiency products by using waveguide integration compared to the uh, free space detectors. Uh, and we basically uh, calculate some curves here and uh, also give a few examples. And our conclusion is that we can actually increase this by about 10 fold. So in the following years, we have different kind of devices coming out. So basically this dots, this dots are basically the 
experimental data reported in different papers. Uh, these are the uh, comparing to the theoretical lines. You can see that basically uh, it is verified. Uh, with the non-ideality factors in device fabrication, the, uh, uh, the uh, dark current and uh, uh, non-ideal uh, depletion, with all this, this stuff considered, uh, basically you can see that the waveguide integration gives you about 10 times better performance compared to free space detectors. So that's basically uh, proved. Uh, another benefit I just mentioned is the uh, dark current. So as you know, basically the dark current, assuming you have a good passivation on the peripheral, peripheral should scale down with the device size. So uh, in our uh, waveguide copper detectors, we can get very small cross sections here like this. So basically this one is about 600 nanometer wide <coughs> and uh, uh, the, the length is about 30 microns. So that gives you a, a very small uh, area. And if you look at the absolute uh, dark current here, so this detector can achieve full responsivity about uh, minus 0.1 volts, which is meaning 0.1 volt reverse bias, and the corresponding dark current is about 130 picoamps. So it's a very low uh, dark current in this case. And also because it can grow in this very uh, small trenches, basically your dislocations will be uh, gliding to the edge of those masses and, and annihilate. So even the dark current density is, is much better. It's about 10 times better than the uh, free space detectors. So overall, in this waveguide integration, you're concentrating more light into a smaller volume. So therefore, it boosts your uh, signal to noise uh, ratio in this case. OK, uh, next few slides, we're going to discuss about the coupling schemes uh, and design principles. So. Uh, if you look at the literature, you find there are different structures you can use for waveguide coupling. Uh, the first one is basically what we call box coupling. Here we have a little bit of complication here, but forget about this, uh, this little segment at the beginning. Just looking at this segment coupling to the center of the germanium detector, which is this uh, red piece. It's like directly connecting two pipes together, except that you need to be careful to match the optical modes in this waveguide and detector. So you can also think about, uh, in this case, your uh, detector is uh, basically a segment of the overall waveguide here. And you're trying to uh, optimize the mode matching along this propagation process. Uh, this fabrication uh, was first done on a uh, silicon on insulator. And I think everybody knows the reason. Basically, you're preventing the mode leak into the substrate. And uh, at that time, uh, that was around 2008 or so. This crystalline silicon waveguide has much lower loss compared to the morphous silicon waveguide. So we decided to let the light transport in this uh, sing, uh, single crystal silicon waveguide on the bottom layer as much as possible. And then we, we come to the uh, detector, we re re raise, it, raise this with a vertical coupler and then butt couple into this detector piece. So this way is basically a very efficient coupling. You can actually get when you get the right mode overlapping, you can get very efficient coupling. You can minimize this device length, so minimize the device area to get higher performance. But uh, often, in this case, you need uh, the uh, selected growth in the trench, so as we have shown before. Uh, more flexible fabrication is basically uh, what we call evanescent coupling approach. In this case, you can either use the uh, crystalline silicon directly as the waveguide and evanescently coupling to this main piece on, uh, on, the, on the top, or you can put a piece of waveguide on top and couple uh, to the uh, germanium waveguide on the uh, germanium detector on the bottom. So compared to this direct buck coupling, usually evanescent coupling is less efficient, and uh, there's some complications here depending on the geometry of the, detect, uh, of the waveguide versus the detector. But it's a relatively simple uh, fabrication process. So about the buck coupling, uh, let me a little bit more detail about this uh, layer to layer of vertical optical couplers. So we want to couple the light from one layer to the other, you know, unlike the electrical signals where you dig the vias to get uh, the, the electrical out, you can utilize the evanescent coupling between two waveguides like this. If you to put two waveguides close enough, basically the optical modes will start to see each other. And if you do this inverse taper structure on both sides, that's basically like automatic solver for the mode matching. So one is coming to from one side, the other coming from the other side. They'll meet somewhere, they'll get a perfect match, and then you get a very efficient coupling between these. 
So this is basically something we designed uh, back in 2008 or so, uh, basically for this buck coupled uh, de detector. So you can see this is the simulation result from the uh, 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 modeling. Uh, at that time, uh, there's a one uncertainty with the refractive index of amorphous silicon because it's highly dependent on your fabrication conditions. But with this kind of inverse uh, taper coupler, with this kind of automatic uh, mode matching solver, no matter how you change this index, you know, in a big range from 3.3 .3 to 3.7, you always find a point where the two optic modes are exactly matched, and you couple to the uh, to the top wave guide almost with 100% efficiency. So this is basically we had uh, de demonstrated greater than uh, greater than 95% coupling efficiency in this case. Uh, this middle figure is basically just a cross section uh, of this waveguide. Okay. So armed with that uh, vertical coupler, you still have to worry about the mode matching. Uh, if you calculate the optical modes in the silicon waveguide versus germanium PD, well, this is, uh, I'm just throwing out a very thick germanium photo detector compared to the thickness of the silicon waveguide. Uh, this is TMO, TM mode. You can obviously see a difference in the mode profile. If you want to get more efficient butt coupling, you want to match those mo uh, mode profiles as, as much as you can. So here's basically uh, a, a design uh, trade-off chart uh, that you can get. So you can reduce the thickness of this germanium layer. Basically, that will better match into the silicon waveguide mode. So of course, uh, correspondingly, you see a higher coupling efficiency uh, in this, in this uh, curve here. So basically, you can see this increasing from about 78% uh, all the way to 95%. On the other hand, other hand, you find that the confinement, optical confinement in this germane layer is decreasing as you reduce the thickness. That means more optical mode is going to see the heavily doped polysilicon and crystalline silicon electrodes on top and bottom. So the optical light you absorb in germanium will contribute to photocurrent. Those absorbed by free carriers in the electrodes top and bottom will not. They will only contribute to heat. So basically, you can see there's a trade-off in terms of uh, achieving the mode coupling versus the uh, optical uh, confinement in the germanium detector for uh, maximum efficiency. So basically, that's the uh, trade-off you need to consider in this kind of design. Uh, for evanescent coupling, uh, things are a little bit more complicated. So uh, we're giving you three um, typical scenarios. Uh, so this is discussed in the paper by Dr. An, who was actually uh, a pioneer in the uh, waveguide coupled detectors. So we have a relatively small difference in the effective index between, uh, between the uh, uh, waveguide material and the uh, photo detector material. As you can imagine, there's better match in the index. Basically, the impedance is much better. So in this case, and uh, uh, assuming your waveguide is basically a small compared to the photo detector, when the light is propagating from left to right and see the germanium photo detector, in this case on the top, basically you see most of the mode is going to be confined in the uh, germanium photo detector. So that's why you get a very fast coupling within a few microns in this case. So you can see uh, from two micron to about Four, uh, five micron, within three microns, pretty much you absorb all the light in this case. So this is a very efficient coupling and uh, you can make a very short device and uh, to get higher, uh, higher, higher uh, bandwidth. However, uh, in some cases you cannot ma maintain this kind of structure. Sometimes you cannot, cannot grow such a thick germanium layer. Uh, sometimes you cannot do such a thin uh, uh, silicon waveguide. So as you move, as, as you move, uh, make their thickness more compatible with one another, you can see this uh, back and forth coupling scheme that you typically see in, in the waveguide coupling uh, uh, in this evanescent approach. So this is almost a constant uh, coupling rate into the germanium detector. Of course, if you want to absorb all the light in this case compared to this case, you need a much longer device. And that means you trade off the bandwidth. Uh, and in some cases, <coughs> actually this does have a uh, real case scenario. For example, uh, waveguide coupled uh, germanium avalanche photodiodes because you need different kind of modification layers in the silicon material, so the thickness can be high, can be about one micron. If you put a thin germane PD on top, basically you can see most of the mode is confined in silicon. It's just very gradually leaking out to the germane detector. In this case, there's a very weak coupling to the photodiode, and therefore you need a very long device. So that will be a limiting factor uh, in the end. 
So in your evanescent coupling design, uh, you will always try to stay with this one, okay? So here's basically a graph showing the uh, summary of uh, detect performance. So with weak guide integration, you can consistently get about one amp per watt uh, responsivity in the uh, 1550 telecom wavelength scale. So, uh, and the uh, dark current and the bandwidth, bandwidth is uh, more than 50 gigahertz. Some people can claim more than 100 gigahertz, but uh, they simply cannot directly measure. So, uh, very good performance here. So, I'll talk very briefly about functionality uh, beyond the photo detectors. So first of all, you know, any photo detector, any photo diode is also a kind of photovoltaic cell. So this is our, uh, one of our first waveguide coupled detectors demonstrated by Dr. An. So you can see basically uh, uh, in this part, you get the photovoltaic uh, mode. You can actually output power from this device. So what you can do with this is basically you can utilize this kind of uh, devices to recover some of the optical power whenever needed. You can also utilize this to, uh, as a, a simple solution, simple alternative to the solution to optical isolators on chip because whenever you want to get rid of the light, you just put the detector there and then convert some of the energy back into electricity. And some smart uh, circuit engineer can design that uh, circuit to utilize this kind of recovered optical power. And this is just to show that even for zero bias photovoltaic mode, nowadays people can get very high data rates like 40 gigabits per second. So we can well trade off some of the uh, high, uh, speed for, for this kind of energy efficiency here. Uh, another interesting thing is that you can actually modulate that absorption by applying electric field uh, because when you apply the field, you know, you can start to absorb photons that's with energy below the band gap by this quantum tunneling process. So using this kind of approach, you can actually turn a, a, a transparent material into opaque by uh, simply uh, uh, applying a large enough electric field. And in this approach, we can actually demonstrate very efficient uh, modulation. So this is a work we have demonstrated in 2008. You can do 25 femtojoules per bit. And uh, this was later taken on by Kotura and in industrialized. Uh, this is their device with uh, 30 uh, gigahertz bandwidth and uh, 60 femtojoules per bit energy consumption. So, uh, and you can also extend this to uh, uh, different channels and shift the wavelengths by using quantum confinement effect. Uh, you can also play some interesting stuff here, which I do not have time to discuss in more detail, but essentially you can connect those together, utilize the photodiode to drive the electroabsorption modulator, and basically turn it on and off and back and, back and forth in different cycles. So just with optical power driving, you can actually generate a kind of oscillating circuit here only with laser power. And a couple of slides beyond telecom wavelengths. So we talked about germane routine uh, alloying. So we recently have discovered a method that can actually crystallize sing, uh, pseudo single crystalline germane routine on uh, any layer. So basically any amorphous layer. So you can do this with back end, line, back end of line fabrication. The uh, trick is that basically you can use a very sharp curvature tip to nucleate and grow the material laterally. So it's almost single crystal in that sense. So we had, have demonstrated this experimentally and show that you can actually push the detection wavelengths beyond three micron in this case. So in conclusion, we show you that waveguide coupled detectors not only just for the circuit uh, completion, it's also for enhancing the detector performance by itself. Uh, we have talked about different coupling schemes and we discussed about functionality beyond uh, a photo detector. And I'd like to thank many long-term collaborators and friends sitting here for your help and support. Thanks. I think we have time for uh, one quick question. Uh, all right, I've got a quick question yeah. for you. So you showed uh, initially uh, starting off that you looked at uh, mm -hmm. how you could uh, engineer the band structure by changing strains. Yes. Have you looked into the uh, repercussions associated with doing that for threading with dislocations and other kind of problems that occur at a material level? So, so, yeah, so, so for the material science level, the key is that you have to make sure that's elastic strain. Okay. So uh, you want to make sure that happens and, uh, uh, you know, no more dislocations generate in that scenario. So basically, a low temperature fabrication process is very important because once you go to high temperature, start to nucleate new dislocations, want to actually uh, suppress that process. 
But on the other hand, I just want to point out that silicon, uh, strain silicon is about 1% strain. So we can actually do that without any problems. All right, good. Thank our speaker again.